Awesome. So welcome everybody and good morning. And thanks to April and to Sila, um, Anna, who's also on the line for helping us make this event possible today. Um, and obviously thank you all for joining us as well. I know you've taken some time out of your day and we really do appreciate that. And hopefully this is gonna be a valuable session for you as well. Um, as you're all familiar with, the Severance on Watershed covers the area from pretty much the township of Tiny in the west to the township of Georgian Bay in the east and south to approximately the Horseshoe Valley Road. Um, and in the 1980s, like we've just polled, Severn Sound was identified as one of the Great Lakes areas of concern. And this community, our community, came together and invested a significant amount of time and money to restore and protect water quality and habitat. And in 2003, Severn Sound was delisted um, as an area of concern, second only in, in Canada to um, Collingwood Harbour, which Gail is very familiar with. In 2009, the Severn Sound Watershed Municipalities, that would be your municipalities, you had the vision to create the SSEA, so our Joint Municipal Service Board, and that's to share the commitment and work to ensure the investment and improvements in water quality were maintained and future threats were managed. And so we're very fortunate today, and I'm really excited about the two speakers that we have with us, two very gifted Great Lakes scientists Dr. John Hartig and Dr. Gail Kranzberg, both with unparalleled expertise um, in and the passion for the Great Lakes and sustainable investment in restoration and protection. I'm going to introduce both of them at once and then I will hand it off to our first speaker. So Dr. Hartig is a visiting scholar at University of Windsor's Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research and the Great Lakes Science Policy Advisor for the International Association for Great Lakes Research. For 14 years, he served as refuge manager for the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge, and he's authored or co-authored over 100 publications on the Great Lakes, including five books. And for the past three years, he's been involved in a binational study of what's been achieved and learned from 35 years of the Great Lakes Remedial Action Plan program. And for those of us who are around in the beginning of the program, at that uh, 35 is a, a surprising number for me. I didn't feel like it was that long ago. Dr. Kranzenberg is actively engaged in research at the interface be between science and public policy with extensive expertise on disciplines involving water, remediation of degraded freshwater ecosystems, regeneration policies for natural ecosystem assets, protection of human health, and the advancement of Great Lakes sustainability. She is currently professor of the engineering and public policy at McMaster University offering Canada's first master's degree in engineering and public policy. She worked for the Ontario Ministry of Environment from 1988 to 2001 as coordinator of Great Lakes programs and senior policy advisor on Great Lakes. Dr. Kranzberg is a past president of the International Association of Great Lakes Research and sits on the board of directors for several Great Lakes and policy related nonprofit organizations. Dr. Kranzberg was also the director of the Great Lakes Regional Office of the International Joint Commission from 2001 to 2005 and has authored more than 200 scientific and policy articles and eight books on issues pertaining to water quality, ecosystem health and sustainability and is a frequent speaker to both the media and the public. So welcome to you both and uh, Dr. Hardick, I, I pass the virtual baton over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to uh, um, be with uh, all of you this afternoon. And uh, uh, it's kind of like old homecoming for Gail and me. We've, uh, we've worked on this issue for a lot of years. And for the last three years, we've been kind of involved in this uh, big picture look at, at what's happened over the last 35 years. But we all know that the uh, Great Lakes represent or have one fifth the standing fresh water on the Earth's surface. Uh, it's amazing. It's unparalleled. It can be seen from space. Uh, the Great Lakes have powered economic growth in both Canada and the United States. But human development, natural resource use and exploitation, and industrial expansion led to some unintended consequences. And first and foremost is pollution of these amazing freshwater resources. Um, uh, they're probably most well known in these 43 
Great Lakes areas of concern that you see on this slide and stretching from Duluth, Minnesota, all the way to the St. Lawrence River. Um, uh, so we, it's been 35 years of cleanup and restoration. One of the big things, one of the real game changers early on was the adoption of an ecosystem approach. This accounting for the interrelationships between air, water, land, and all living things, including humans, and involving all user groups in management. It was really, really significant for this program. So uh, like Julie said, we've been doing this study, what has been achieved and learned from this 35 year effort. And as part of that, Gail and I have been involved in looking at 10 case studies uh, of how environmental cleanup has led to economic and community revitalization. Um, uh, all the way from Buffalo River uh, to Toronto, and of course, uh, Severn Sound is one of those as well. Um, so think of the Buffalo River, you know, uh, by the 1950s and 1960s, both industrial and municipal effluents were literally overwhelming the river, and there were no fish in the lower um, Buffalo River because it was anaerobic. It was devoid of oxygen. Then in January of 1968, it caught on fire and the predecessor of the US EPA uh, was called the Federal Water Pollution Control Administration. They said the Buffalo River is a repulsive holding basin of industrial and municipal wastes. It is devoid of oxygen and almost sterile. Oils, phenols are present in large amounts. So what a beginning for this. So again, the wrap process started in 1985. Um, the Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper, uh, an NGO, um, has sort of championed the, the cleanup in more recent years, and they brought in over $75 million to restore the river. A cleaner river has led to improved public access, and this has led to economic revitalization. Between 2012 and 2018, nearly $200 million in waterfront development has occurred along the river. And these before and after photos tell the whole story. The photo on the left is, of course, the lower Buffalo River uh, in 2014, and here it is in more recent uh, years. So an amazing transformation and a, um, a rediscovery of the, of the Buffalo River. Um, here's where I come from, <clears throat> this is the Detroit River. On the left-hand side of the screen is the Rouge River, which is it's the only area of concern to have an area of concern in it. So the Rouge River dumps into the Detroit River and you can see oil and raw sewage coming in. You also see a conical shaped plume, that's the submerged discharge pipe from the largest uh, single site wastewater treatment plant in the United States, the Detroit Wastewater Treatment Plant. So in the 1960s, it was one of the most polluted rivers in North America. Um, over 40 years of pollution prevention and control has led to some surprising ecological revival. Uh, return of bald eagles, peregrine falcons, osprey, lake sturgeon, lake whitefish, walleye, mayflies, and even uh, uh, about a dozen beaver. Um, it is literally, if you add that up, it's one of the most remarkable ecological recovery stories in North America because of where the Detroit River started. Um, literally about 15 years ago, um, as the river started to clean up, um, people started asking for um, greater public access to the Detroit River. And of course, Detroit was an industrial town and the whole waterfront was dominated by industry. So they came together and created a blue ribbon committee and created this organization called the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy that had a vision of a uh, linked greenway system from Belle Isle, which was a 983 acre island park in the Detroit River, all the way to the Ambassador Bridge to Canada, about 5.5 miles in length. In the first 10 years, they raised $140 million to build the Detroit Riverwalk. And you, you probably will remember that Detroit was the largest city in the United States to go through bankruptcy. So in the worst economic times, they raised $140 million in the first 10 years. That $140 million 
um, led to a billion dollars of additional investment uh, economic benefits to the community. And the Mark Wallace here, the president and CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy says, without the early focus on cleaning up the river and improving water quality, this transformation of the river's edge would not have been possible. Uh, we all know about Hamilton Harbor being the steel capital of Canada, and uh, it has the uh, legacy of environmental contamination down in sediments. And one of the uh, worst ones is Randall Reef. So that is right now the largest contaminated sediment remediation site in the Canadian portion of the Great Lakes. Cost of that is $140 million to do that. Um, uh, they have did an economic uh, benefits study that what would happen afterwards, um, the the, it would become land, it would be capped, and it would expand port operations. So Randall Reef Sediment Remediation is projected to realize $600 million in benefits to local businesses and $500 million to recreational users. And uh, just continuing the story, um, now that is leading to rediscovering the West Waterfront as well. And you can see some of the uh, redevelopment that's occurring here on the west waterfront portion of Hamilton Harbor. Uh, all of you know Severin Sound better than Gail and me, but uh, you had a 20-year cleanup that culminated in delisting. You are one of only seven that have been delisted thus far. Congratulations, that's no small feat. Uh, your innovative partnership, that Severn Sound Environmental Association is a joint municipal services board and it helped provide community-based cost-effective environmental management to achieve delisting. And indeed, uh, we think it is a model for cooperation and partnerships throughout the basin. Um, you did a story, a, a study uh, part way through uh, and that found that the total monetary value monetary value of the RAP restoration projects implemented between 91, 1991 and 2002 was estimated about $35 million. The total cost of restoration projects during that same time period was estimated about $2.2 million. That would mean every dollar spent on restoration would generate about $16 in benefits reflecting cost effectiveness of the RAP restoration projects. These benefits were based on a 10-year lifespan, meaning they were only estimated for 10 years. Um, so again, congratulations to all you have accomplished. But as we have seen throughout the whole basin, uh, you must continue to work together. The sustainability of Severn Sound takes care and feeding. That means it takes stewardship. Continued cooperation and investment will be needed to protect Severn Sound for future generations. Our lessons learned for Gail and me, building partnerships and fostering collaborative financing leads to success. Area of concern cleanup spurs reconnecting to these waterways via greenways and blueways that leads to economic and community revitalization. Investing in the cleanup of Great Lakes areas of concern means investing in revitalization of rice, rust belt communities. The Great Lakes Commission and the Council of Great Lakes Industries completed a study in 2018 that showed for every federal dollar spent under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in the United States during 2010 through 2016 would produce an additional $3.35 of economic activity through 2035. Again, an, an excellent return on investment. Cleanup of areas concern can also change the perception from being recognized as polluted rivers and harbors in the Rust Belt to being regarded as healthy ecosystems that improve quality of life, celebrate rich history and culture, strengthen the economy, foster a sense of place, and help achieve competitive advantage. Um, uh, Keith Sherman was a partner in this study. Um, these documents are available online. You don't need to write these uh, uh, URLs down, but uh, we will share them uh, with April and Julie later, and you can get that through an email. But it's the Great Lakes Revival Report and a companion piece in the Journal of Great Lakes Research there. So 
Uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over now to Gail to um, respond to some of the things that um, I have said and to add her perspective to this story of Great Lakes Revival. Gail? Thank you very much, John. I, there's not a lot for me to add. Uh, John is so eloquent and, and passionate about his exposition about raps. I'm going to relay a few little anecdotes. I used to work for the Ministry of the Environment and I was in charge of the rap program for the Ministry of the Environment. And would not infrequently in the 90s get uh, phone calls. Well, we weren't doing a lot of emails back then. Wanting to know where the areas of concern was were because we're tourists and we want to avoid them. We don't want to go fishing there. And this was a, a real eye opener. I had a hard time answering the questions, but it was a real eye opener. Now I come from the personal experience of having the privilege of, of uh, coordinating the Collingwood Harbor Remedial Action Plan just, just down the way from where we are uh, in Severn Sound. Um, when I started that project, they wanted nothing at all to do with us. Don't tell us we're a toxic hotspot. We're a four season destination location based on the pristine waters of Georgian Bay. Collingwood is a beautiful place. We don't need this mar on our, on our, on our, on the way we market ourselves. Within a year that turned around to saying, you know what, we, if you really want to know how your boat rests in the water, just put it in Collingwood Harbor for a day because it'll be ringed with algae. That's not acceptable. And the community came together um, with the mayor and the deputy mayor on our public advisory committee. We did the work that we needed to do. We got the investments that we needed to do. I don't need to tell you the story, but the return on investment was also quite astonishing with the redevelopment of former industrial places. Um, this, the importance though, is that we had to figure out delisting and what we would do afterwards because there is development pressure on the waterfront. That was not gonna go away. The rap was there in presence when we were still working on it. We were in the media, we were at council, everybody knew about us, but once we were delisted, would we be forgotten and would things backslide? And in fact, no, we created, like you have the uh, Environmental Association, we created Environment Network as a nonprofit and they continue to work with the town Every time there was a proposal to do something that might have any impact on the water quality in the harbor, they were consulted. They kept the connections, all the networks that they had developed over the course of developing the RAP stayed intact. And that organization is alive today because the issue of cleaning up the Great Lakes is a lifelong issue. Like John and I will have a job for as long as we retire, as long as we want to, even when we retire, we'll have a job because protecting the Great Lakes is forever. There will always be growth, there will always be land use changes, developmental changes, new chemicals of concern, plastic pollution, you name it. We need to be very cautious to sustain the gains made and what gains they are. I just learned, for example, that the Great Lakes cruise ships now stop at Midland Harbor. Would they do that if it was like the Buffalo River that John started with? Would they do that if it was choked with algae? Would they do that if it was putrid with fish dying because of lack of oxygen? Absolutely not. That's a huge boon to the economy of the region because investing in environmental protection is investing in human health, it's investing in human mental health, and it's investing in fish and wildlife. And if you don't care about the creatures that have no voice, it builds the economy of the region. So when I look at um, being proud of completion, there also comes this tension to never backslide. One of the things that I also did in Collingwood was 10 years after we delisted, they were redeveloping a big brownfield. And we had already written a sustainability report for the, with the town planners saying, if you're going to redevelop places around the harbor, here's what to watch out for. Here's where there's habitat that needs to be protected. Here's where the water could stagnate if you put in too many infills. And I went up to Collingwood and I just said I was interested in a condominium and where am I putting my boat? Why isn't there a marina here? And they put up pictures from our wrap document. 
10 years earlier that said, oh, we can't do that because the cleanup, this was the first one in Canada to be cleaned up and we can't backslide. These were the real estate developers. So what I'm telling you by the story is that by keeping the spirit of the rap alive after delisting, celebrating success, it just, it's a, it's a magical element that many other communities can learn from. As John said, the Severance Island Environmental Association is a model of cooperation that had never been imagined anywhere before. It's a collaborative, it's a cooperative, because everybody shares the vision of a healthy ecosystem means a healthy economy. So I want to congratulate you for what you've done, encourage you to continue the fine work that you're doing. And, and um, I think that that's all I'm going to say in closing remarks. And so, Julie, I think I'll hand it back to you if you want to open it up for questions. Great. Well, thank you very much to uh, both Gail and John. Um, and uh, it's it's already it, it fascinates me. Some of you know that uh, I um, I left Severn Sound as we were delisting because I thought it meant that I would be unemployed, um, and I'm now back. So that's oh goodness, 20 years ago myself. And um, it's uh, it's it's pretty exciting what Gail just mentioned, being able to. Uh, look at an area and look at particularly the association where all of uh, the municipalities who've joined us online today are continuing to stay committed uh, to making sure that, um, you know, that the quality, uh, water quality and habitat quality here remains.